Well, and uh, if you were here last week, I won't make you show your hands, but if you were here last week, you heard the gospel. And, the Peter, and Peter, last week, declared that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And this was a huge revelation to Peter and the disciples. But this week, just as quickly as he was praised by Jesus a few short verses ago, now he is severely scolded. Jesus says, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. Ouch. Poor Peter. Last week, he was the best with the gold star, and this week, he's Satan. So what happened? Now, Messiah is a word that has many meanings, but most commonly back then, the Jewish people were waiting for what we call a kingly Messiah, a ruler like King David, strong, who would overthrow the oppressive Roman government and free the Israelites, a leader who would guide the chosen people to freedom, much like Moses. And this is most likely what Peter thought Jesus would be. So when Peter learns that Jesus will be rejected by the Jewish people and then killed, his heart breaks. All his hopes and dreams are shattered. If Jesus dies, he cannot save them from their Gentile oppressors. So he tells Jesus that he must be wrong. God would not do that to them. Peter is speaking out of grief here, a grief for a future that he imagined that will not be. Jesus will not be crowned a king. Rather, he will be killed. But when Jesus rebukes Peter, he isn't just rebuking him, but he's rebuking the world. You see, Peter was thinking of a powerful Messiah, but to him, that meant someone with political power, with strength and popularity, a king. And those were the values of the world, then and now, as well. You know that phrase, might makes right. And that idea that anyone with wealth and power is the winner. Well, people think that value comes from how much money you have, or how many cars you have, or how big your house is, how many people that work under you at your job. And Peter thought like that too but maybe without the cars, I guess donkeys. But Jesus here invites us to think of our worth in a different way. Our worth does not come from our accomplishments or our possessions. It is a gift from God. Jesus wants us to know that our possessions don't define who we are. Rather, our identity comes from the fact that we are children of God. Because life is much more than a race or a competition to see who gets the most stuff. <clears throat> now, they wanted a strong Messiah, and instead they got a poor carpenter's son, a traveling preacher, and a troublemaker, who was eventually crushed by the government. And that is something that is key to Jesus being the son of the living God, as Peter said, the life part. That's what Peter didn't get because all living things eventually die. And in many ways, we still want God to be a strong warrior, ruler. We want God to vanquish our foes for us and solve all our problems for us, save us from tragedy, just like Peter today. But that isn't what we get all the time. Instead, we get a call to serve. Here, Jesus tells us to take up the cross and serve God ourselves. We are called into the story as participants, not just onlookers. Now, taking up your cross is a complex thing. It doesn't mean to put yourself on it, as sometimes we do. You know that phrase, we all have our crosses to bear. Well, that phrase has a negative connotation. You like my acting, right? 
Now, some people seek out a cross to bear in order to seem pious. But bearing the cross shouldn't have that negative connotation. It shouldn't be a burden. It should be a privilege. It doesn't mean suffering. Bearing the cross means knowing God's love, spreading that love, living out the mission that Jesus gives us. Bearing our cross means knowing that wealth and power and authority are not what make us great. Those things do not define us. Our identity comes from God, a God who loves and who blesses, who lives now through us. And it's hard to take up the cross in this new way because it's hard to reject a lot of what our society tells us, to ignore the constant bombardment of noise that says, if we were just a little bit more rich, or this thing can make you just a little bit more beautiful, or a little bit more popular, or just a little bit more, more, then we'll be happy and perfect. We have to reverse that and know what true honor is, what true worth is, and what true blessing is, and know that we are already perfect. And so today, Peter's poor heart breaks. It breaks because his friend has just told him that he's going to die. But it breaks also because all the hopes for the world that Peter had were resting on this idea of a kingly Messiah, someone to save them. But sometimes our hearts have to break so that they can be changed so that they can be made new and stronger, fortified by the love of God, a love that is much stronger than fear and sin and even death. That's the promise that we get today, but we actually get it every day. Our enemies probably won't be smited or smote or whatever, smitten, smitten by God. Thank you. All of our wishes will not be granted. And what we thought our lives would be like probably won't come to pass the way that we think it is, right? But we always have the love of God and the grace given us from God freely. And that should always be our cross to bear. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.